Uh, Father, every time we uh, gather together, uh, we give you thanks. Uh, Father, we're grateful for physical families and we're grateful for uh, the love and the tradition and the care that uh, we have received uh, through many decades, but we're tonight especially grateful for our spiritual family. And we pray as we work through uh, these lessons that uh, it would strengthen our nuclear families, our blood families, but we also pray that our families would contribute to uh, a stronger spiritual uh, family as well. And for the many ways you've loved us and blessed us and cared for us, uh, may we say thank you. So I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So last week we talked about um, the book, Fantastic Families, based on a 25-year study of 14,000 families all, all over the country, all over the world. And, and the real key, instead of trying to find out what was wrong with families, the researchers decided to identify what families were doing right that made them strong, happy, and healthy. And so the goal, uh, what, what we're hoping to do in the class is not to teach about why families fail, uh, but to highlight how strong families succeed. These, uh, these are the six characteristics as they study all these different families and they started to see similar qualities or characteristics from all the study. Uh, we're just gonna do this quickly. Uh, commitment, we talked about that last week. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about appreciation and affection, uh, positive communication, time together, uh, the importance of spiritual well-being, the ability to cope with stress and crisis. Uh, tonight, appreciation and affection. Next week, Dale will be on his own. We're going we're gonna to go away from this uh, outline for a week to talk specifically about the importance of family traditions. Then we'll come back to hitting each of these six characteristics. In the introduction to the chapter that dealt with um, appreciation and affection, it's a story of a man, he's, he's talking about his experience. He's at his father's grave, and he's trying to make peace, all he ever wanted. All, all, all he had ever hoped for was a word of appreciation, just some affection. And now his father was gone and it's too late. And, and, he, and he said it like this, the one thing I wanted most, the thing I never got, was to know that he loved me. I, I wanted him to say he loved me, uh, to say other things that gave proof of those words. I wanted his approval, and it never came. Uh, that's how powerful this is. It's how important it is to have a healthy sense of appreciation, affection. The impact, uh, I think, is measurable when it's there and equally painful and measurable when it's not. They yeah. We have another outline as well because I didn't want to confuse you with the one that we've got and we'll kind of talk into it as we go. When I, because we're obviously reading through the same thing. Uh, I've had, and these had just had to be guys, I've, I've had three guys through the years that, that in one case the mother, the other two cases the father died and they could not remember one time that the parent had given them any sense of approval. And one of them, uh, one of the best kids we ever had in a youth group, he was a uh, student body president, he was on the football team, he was on the baseball team, might even have been on the honor roll, and he could not remember one time that his father said good job, well done or anything and in, in one sense that kind of scars you for life in one sense but one of the things that I think is really, really important about our church family is that obviously the ideal is for us to have a husband and a wife mom and a dad but most of us, as our kids grow up, know families that for whatever reason, one or the other's not there. <clears throat> and one of the things that we can do in the church family is to embrace and to help and to encourage and fill in the gaps with that. I told Tim, I wanted to do this one because um, I had a great family, but my dad never hugged me one time, <clears throat> took to memory. Um, 
there used to be an old Western song about the wooden Indian, poor Roe Kalaja, he never got a kiss, poor Roe Kalaja, and it's this wooden Indian standing on I was going to sing that one, didn't I? <laughs> 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 okay. We're 26 years old, we're getting ready to go halfway around the world for three years, and I hug him and he can't hug me back. Okay, we have to let people be who they are. Okay, we can't put unrealistic expectations on them. Sarah's halfway to Amarillo. We were in the heart of the Dust Bowl, and our families are Dust Bowl survivors, and that that strength and that toughness that allowed them to stay was also the same thing that was hard for them to express verbal, physical things because your greatest strengths can be your greatest weaknesses. I tried to talk to Sheila five times unsuccessfully the first semester at Oklahoma Christian, and I was so smitten I couldn't get anything to come out of my mouth and would just stand there and would finally walk off. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I know that just made such a just, you know, unforgettable impression on her. It's like, what well, well, can't even talk, you know, and it just, it just wouldn't come out. So on the 12th of January at 845 in New Testament survey with Hugo McCord in Cogswell Alexander Hall, I'm going to take a deep breath and count to three, and if I die, I'm going to ask her out. <laughs> and I nearly passed out. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to take a deep breath. I'm going to count to three, and I'm 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 going to go ask her out. So I said, if we have a basketball game Friday night, would you like to go? And she said, Well, you're the basketball player. You ought to know. <laughs> uh, boy, in the palm of my hand, this is going great. I said, Let me rephrase that. If we do that, and she says, Well, yes. Are you sure? And if you know her, she said, well, I did say yes, didn't I? <laughs> anyway, that was my introduction very quickly to the Dodgen family. <laughs> and you, you think, she was a sophomore when Craig is born. And so that gives you some, kind of some context for, for where the family is. But you come from a family that, that we just don't hug each other. And we would go over, they had this wonderful brown leather couch that just said, try me when we come in. So I would take a nap occasionally. And I wake up after a nap one day and my girlfriend is sitting in her father's lap with her arm around his neck. And I'm going, oh dear, B because we would just, I, I can't tell you, we, when I say we would never have done that, we would never have done that. Two or three weeks later, I come back, Richard's playing tight end for Putman West, and I open my eyes, and here's Richard sitting in his father's lap, and I'm thinking, oh, it's worse than I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I can't tell you what a culture shock it was to kind of come into this family where the dad was, was like the spiritual hearth and warmth of the whole family. And one of the things that I talk with couples as they get married and stuff for you to think about is that in all of our experiences, we're fortunate that we can look at either families, blood families, or even role models of families at church, and we can choose to bring certain characteristics and certain qualities into our families. And so I had an enormous learning curve to just learn how to do this because I didn't know how to do that. But every time we got together, and about five weeks, I asked her, I said, can I just call you mom? She said, that would be wonderful. So I always just called her mom and dad. But every time we got together, I watched Jack Dodgen because he was a master at hugging people, loving people, including people, and doing that. And the reason I mention that is that for as many of us that are here, some of us have done that kind of naturally, and others of us will be kind of in a learning curve. And I just want to start and say the things that we're going to talk about are things I had to learn because in my family, those things weren't there. There's some wonderful, wonderful other things, but those things weren't there. Now, I want to do this very quickly and leave most of you to read, but I want you to look under number three. <clears throat> I've mentioned this to you, and it starts tomorrow. 
Each year, I try to take eight grandchildren by themselves to the state fair. And all the years I was doing two sermons and three classes, I can wake up at four o'clock and work on lessons or stay up late or whatever. But I just try to take each of the grandchildren by themselves to the <coughs> state fair. And these three things are operative. And Ross Campbell wrote this really amazing book. And the first three to me are really important, eye contact. Did your mother ever make eye contact with you at church and didn't have to say a word and you, you, nothing had to be said? If, if, if that influence is there negatively, how much positively can it be with positive eye contact? And you stop and think, small children very seldom have direct eye contact from adults. It's getting harder as I get older, but if I can, I will try to get on a knee to get down to talk to little people so we can have eye contact because that says something to them non-verbally about their value and who they are. And so every time that I can, while I'm with them, we're going to have direct eye contact. We try to go away, as, and we'll talk about this next week. We, we go to deep south Texas the week of Memorial Day, and... As our <clears throat> third grader said last year, Papa takes the boys for breakfast and he takes the ladies to lunch. And so I try to take each one of the guys to breakfast and number one, eye contact. The second one is so important. Let's, well, let's go to the third one because I put them in a different order. <clears throat> Focused attention. I, I'll do this quickly because this just hurts me so deeply. How many tables are at a restaurant and mom or dad are on their cell phone and here are two or three kids right across the table? I, I would just like to go over and throw the cell phone in the trash while, while they're there and just say, your kids are gonna be gone. And you have this golden opportunity while they're there. And so eye contact, focused attention, appropriate physical touch. And again, those are things I had to learn. Um, my dad for years woke up at 4.30. He oftentimes let us sleep in until 5.30 and uh, we would work till dark. My going away present, we plowed 24 hours a day in a field of 80 acres that hadn't been plowed in 20 years. One of us slept in the back pickup, one went in and milked the cows, never said goodbye. He was never there when I left, but my going away college present was we plowed 24 hours a day with one of us sleeping in the back of the pickup at night for my going away present. So I wasn't missing contact, but those specific things were never part of my family. So as we talk about appreciation, showing affection, those three things are really, really important. And I'll just say this, something to ask ourselves if one of our children is misbehaving is that their emotional tank may be on empty so there may have been some withdrawals. And part of my philosophy, we'll talk about in another context, we prevent a lot of discipline by bringing discipline to our family. The school teacher knows exactly what I'm talking about. If, if we have certain routines, we make certain emotional and spiritual investments in them. But I'm just saying with my grandchildren, <clears throat> tomorrow night, Isaac is now singing the deep bass part in the Edmund Memorial Choir. And I said, Mady, I'd like you to go to hear the Oak Ridge Boys because one of the premier bass singers for the last 40 years is in the Oak Ridge Boys. He may not know some of the songs, but with each one of them, we try to do something that matches. Okay, he's a sophomore. He's coming on 13. He's wearing a size 13 shoe and he's 6'3". So I'll have to do this for eye contact now. But these three things, are very, very specific. And so while I'm with him, I want to have as much positive eye contact, whatever he wants to talk about, we're going to talk about, and we are going to hug the forward coming. Since he's older, our project for the elders, we're putting all the characters and all the books of the Old Testament in chronological order. So as we go to the fairgrounds, we'll work on that. With the little kids, we're doing BBS songs. So those are some things that are just a part I'm, of that. I'm thinking of the last lesson I heard you preach combined with tonight when you're at the grocery store you want to spank other people's kids <laughs> no you put your, put your hands, hands in, your, in pocket. your pockets and when you're at the restaurant you want to throw away their cell phones <laughs>
what, what he said, and I, and I asked him when we were preparing for tonight's class if he remembered the first time he met Macy. Because I know that Dale does what he just described. Eye contact, focused attention. Um, I think she left that meal. I went over to preach at East Side. We all went out, the three of us went out to eat. I felt like I wasn't even there. <laughs> but he showed her so much focused attention, took an interest in her. I thought made her feel important, and validated. Um, and I, I think, I know how that made her feel. I think how that makes our children feel. So we're looking at six secrets. The first one is dig for diamonds. The authors of the book talk about people who actually do that. Think about all the dirt they look through to find a diamond. And, and that one diamond makes it worth all the effort to dig through all the dirt. And, and, the, and the warning is, don't, don't, don't skip the diamonds in, in your family, your wife and your children, and look for the dirt instead. Does that make sense? Sometimes we emphasize the negative things. We dig for the dirt instead of digging for the diamonds. There, there are things that I loved about Tawny 25 years ago that are still very attractive and appealing to me now. Let's focus on those things. Let's build on those things that, that make her the wonderful person that she is and do that same thing for your children. It's easy to find the mistakes, the bad behavior, and I won't go into the whole story, but there's a story of a father that he came home long day, he's tired, he takes it out on his son, and, and the line was that he was expecting an adult head on a, on a child's shoulders. Let's be fair in the expectations that we have of our children. And let's look for the positive things. Let's dig for the diamonds. Dale? We always put out hummingbird feeders. Um, in our house, we, we had lived in for 30 years. Everything I planted either is hummingbird or butterfly friendly through the seasons. And I read a quote once that said, what's the difference between a buzzard and a hummingbird? And the response was where they put their nose. We can extinguish some lower levels of bad behavior by not reinforcing it. <clears throat> and this was just a real blessing. Previous century, previous life, you know, we're in a small town in Western Oklahoma, but I got to be the, the school quarterback from sixth grade through 12th grade. And I felt like I want to know what every person does on every play and if Wayne comes back to the huddle a little bit cross-eyed, he got dinged or something, then I want to protect him on the next play or two to let him kind of catch his breath to do that. But you've got eye contact in the huddle with every one of these guys, and Dane has done the same thing as a catcher. You, you try to get the best out of who's on the field, but you try to protect them. And that's what's really important about this digging for diamonds because we tend to find what we're looking for. I'll just do this really quick. I'm milking cows by the time I'm four because my older sister can only hold two siblings in the rocking chair when dad's gone. So I have to go to the barn for there's snow or what. By six, I'm on the tractor. My dad's never heard of child labor laws. <laughs> and so I'm either 10 or 11 and I'm at, out my new liberty at Grandpa Hartman Place cultivating the cotton. And, and I've probably come from, from the, the wall about here, and I feel kind of funny. I look back. I haven't hooked a wire. I have hooked a post, and the fence is following me out into the field. I have never done that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Not once. <clears throat> I, I have torn out a quarter mile of fence. The posts are out of the ground. The wire's all tangled up. I push down the clutch, and I look up, and I go, <sighs> I know better, I shouldn't have done that. I look up and here comes my grandfather. Now what, what are some things he could have said to me? I mean, you think of all the things he could have said and what did Granddad Luther say? Son, we need to get this fixed before your dad shows up. <laughs> and we worked for two hours. He had the post hole diggers and he had the bar, but we had to take the wire off of every post. We had to then take the post and put them in. And it took, it, we were just like you had a garden hose. We were drenched wet. And thankfully, 
the Lord was good. Dad didn't, didn't show up while we were doing this. And so at the end of the day, my dad did come and I told him the truth. He said, son, I thought you would get more done today. And I said, dad, some days it just takes longer than others. <laughs> I told him the truth. And that's why, and I say this with tongue in cheek, the reason why grandparents and grandchildren are so close is that sometimes we share a common enemy. <laughs> My mother laughed. <laughs> But you stop but, but but you stop and think, I'm ten years old, and that's still in my mind because there were so many things he could have pointed out that I did wrong, and all he said was, We need to get this fixed, let's work on that, and not one time did he ever say, You idiot, you know better, you shouldn't have done that, all those other things. And I have just sometimes left a store and have cried because of the way that a mom or a dad is speaking to their child in the store. It just can I say criminal, you know what I'm trying to say? And, and that's why this digging for diamonds is so important. And you look at those passages like Philippians 4 and 8, think on these things. And, and again, I'm back with my grandfather. We were always called sir. Our grandfather always called us sir. You tend to learn respect if you're given respect. And that's something that can be very, very important with us. And I know we can have a bad day, and I know we can do this, but that's this digging for diamonds kind of permeates all the rest of it. I think some, some of what you're saying there leads to this, which is affirm your children verbally. Yeah. And, and you feel, I mean, all these years later, you remember. Can, can I throw this out for you to think about? That people say, well, they don't say it, but they show it. I think a lot of people maybe would say, they don't they don't say the words i love you but they show it well listen i think that's great you should say it I, I know that actions speak louder than words but it's not enough just to show it sometimes our spouse our children they need to hear us say it others well i say it yeah but do you show it and so those things go together i, I want you to think about if if god the father on two occasions at the baptism and the transfiguration shows affection and appreciation to his son. And he says for his son to hear, this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased. Do not, do not doubt the need that Jesus had for that affirmation to hear his father say those words when he had such a tremendous mission and facing overwhelming suffering that would come when, when all of our sins are laid on him. And for, for God to say that at crucial moments, how powerful that is. I know that some are introverted. I know that some are, uh, again, but in my actions, I try to show it. Do not underestimate how much your spouse needs to hear words of affection and appreciation and how much that means to our children. Uh, anything on that point, Dale? Well, and, and not just when they're small, but I, I just think we need to hug our kids every time we can because there'll be some time that we won't or can't. Um, I've been in three hospital rooms where couples married 50 or 60 years uh, kissed each other goodbye for the last time. And I'm just very, very conscious of that. And especially when our kids are little, and this is just our preference. We're not saying this, everyone should do this. But we just had this thing. We're going to do a family, and we'll talk about this next week. We're going to do a family devotional every night. And, and when, our, when we're little, this is a family devotional. We're holding each other. We're talking about things. We may get down to the floor and read. But being in church with little ones was a great opportunity for us to hug. And that, that to me is really, really important because everything we can do to kind of reinforce those so that our kids always grow up feeling that they've been loved and valued is really, really important. And we decide if we're gonna become, and I love this analogy, we decide as parents if we're gonna become a thermometer or a thermostat. And a thermometer just registers the level, the thermostat sets the level. And because these are things I had to learn, and, and like I said, 
I will always be indebted to my father-in-law because he just, he excelled it. And he was the only child. You would help there have been 10 kids in the family if you knew Jack Dodson. And there was just always a sense of loving and helping and encouraging. And it was just such a wonderful, wonderful role model for us. But that's something that we press on to our kids, pass on to our kids. The next one is to expect children to be affectionate and appreciative. I think we model it, right? They, they, would, they would learn this hopefully by our example. The authors of the book uh, that, we're, that we're borrowing from, they said it's, it's been suggested that showing our appreciation and gratitude to others is as important to their well-being as water is to flowers. Children can be taught to water the flowers. We want to teach our children how to do these things. I know that you talk about the hospital ministry with your children and grandchildren. Some of the most meaningful memories, I think, with our kids when they were very small, and they're, and they're not anymore. I mean, they've, they've pretty much grown up, was taking them to see some of the elderly members of the congregation, the shut-ins, the widows, widowers, hospitals, and, and teaching them to show, again, I like your appropriate affection, and, and to show appreciation, I think that has helped them in their faith development and their character development. And I think that has made us a stronger, a happier, healthier family is to model that and to, and to bring them along and make them a part of our ministry. And I, it's amazing. I mean, nobody will be surprised. But little Callie coming into a room, people didn't even know I was there. I mean, they, they were so happy to see her. And a uh, little old lady in the hospital for her to hold uh, this woman's hand and say a prayer with her. Uh, how great of a memory is that for the member of this congregation and then for our family, teaching, modeling, affection, and appreciation. Go ahead and pass the position. Let's go to the next. These are, these are six secrets. Share humor and playfulness, and, and this is important because um, it's not sarcasm. It's not mean-spirited humor. Uh, this is something where the years later you look back and you remember, you know, we're storytellers and, and we love to kind of you remember that one time. And that's really healthy for families to have funny family memories that, that we tell. And some of them we tell over and over again, favorite stories that, that are just great memories. Just the other, just the other day, Tony was like, do you remember that time? Because uh, Ryder, half the time, like he showed up here one night and was like, oh, shoes. Yeah, that, you should have probably put shoes on. I mean, I, I never thought to look. I just thought it was obvious. You put your shoes on. She was sitting in our car, and he walked to one that looked like uh, our car, and he got in. <laughs> and she enjoyed that so much, sitting there watching him, waiting for the discovery. And he started looking around like, this does not look. <laughs> oh, there they are. And Tawny's just dying, right? So and those stories are fun to remember and fun to tell. Why? Well, because we love our life together. It's, it's a great, we love our family. We love our stories and those funny things, those funny things that, that happen, you know. And so share humor and, and playfulness. This is, we enjoy each other's company. Uh, we like to laugh and tell stories. That's part of a, a fantastic family. I'll talk more about that next week. So okay. Um, purposefully encourage affection and appreciation. And, and I think that this is something, as I was reading this week's chapter, that parents are teaching their children. And I was thinking about my mom and dad are sitting here tonight. I think they did a really good job of this. We visited elderly family members. We visited grandparents. Uh, they made us sing in a church chorus. Do y'all remember that? Where we would go to the nursing homes and all those little old ladies with the whiskers would give us a... I'm sorry. I it's too late to take it back now. Uh, but we had to go and talk to all of the older people. Do you remember, do you remember when we would leave Maim and Pap's house? This was, was that your aunt and uncle? We, they were like grandparents to us. Do you remember that we would look out the back window of the car as we were driving home and we would wave until we couldn't see him anymore right if if uh if we received a gift and there was a what do you say what well, you say thank you uh, when you leave uh you say you know you say thank you you give hugs if we want our children to do better we have to teach them how to do better and and they'll learn 
they, they, will, they will learn by our example and by our encouragement and by our instruction to enjoy uh, other people. You know, sometimes I hear about, you know, well, in BK, you know, we bring our teenagers and, well, there's, there's no other teenagers and just all these older people. Listen, some of the best influence on my children and their faith growing up in this congregation are the older people who have always showered them with attention and taken an interest in them. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't allow them to skip those opportunities. When they're teenagers and they don't want to go, they need to be there. And we need to, we need to teach and train them how to show uh, appreciation and affection and how to receive that, which is, which is really, and I think this is important, how to accept, so, sometimes when somebody compliments us, we don't wanna, we don't wanna seem arrogant or proud or, you know what, and, and, we, and we take away from their compliment. And we shouldn't do that, especially in our families, because that shuts down that, that process of continually thanking one another, expressing love, giving compliments, if you don't know what else to say, just say thank you. Can I just say, especially with preaching, because you, you, there's a tendency towards ego anyway, there's a tendency towards pride, it's a very dangerous thing. And, and so when somebody compliments a lesson, and, and you, what do you, you know, I wanna make sure, I've heard God, well, to God be the glory, <coughs> right? I, yes, how about just thank you? Um, people are trying to tell you that they appreciate your efforts and whether it's a spiritual thing or something in you know, the physical life of your family, learn to gracefully accept compliments. Don't shut that down uh, because it's uncomfortable for you to receive a compliment. Dale, anything on that? Well, and, and just for us guys, a really important passage, and it, when I read the elder qualities, there's only a few of them that are just for elders, and most of them apply to men in general. And one of the really, really important ones to me is that Paul says the elder is, is to be a household manager. He manages well his own household. <clears throat> and one translation says he presides over his household in a beautiful manner. And we'll talk about this next week. Our girls do so much <clears throat> sticking and holding things together with good ideas. But if we take the initiative in our families, we can raise the level of appreciation. We can raise those different levels. This was several years ago. We had seven or eight guys, most of them were deacons, kids or late grade school, maybe early junior high. And we just had the father's thing and talk about this. And, and we had a two week assignment. And I, and I said, without saying anything to your wife, okay, don't, don't say anything at all. This week, would you just treat your wife like you did when you were dating? Jeff Whitehead and guys in that, that group are in here. And I said, don't say anything at all, but just, just we're in life and you're trying to, to have a career, you're trying to feed your family. We didn't marry her to ignore her or to take her for granted, but I said, this week, without saying, just treat your wife like you did when you were dating. I had two wives call me and say, I think he's having an affair. <laughs> they came back and all of them said, she is just dying to know what on earth is going on. And I said, we're just gonna do this for another week. Just, just be very thoughtful and treat your wife like you did when she was dating. The third girl called me and she says, I think he's terminal. <laughs> Has he received a cancer diagnosis or something? And all that we did was just be specific and intentional. And I said, just for this time, stop and think. We have a big impact on the emotional and relate. And, and again, we're men and we're trying to earn a living and all this other stuff. But when we finally told them, we got the girls together and we laughed and laughed because virtually every girl in the group was suspicious that something was going on or something was wrong or something was happening. 
and what was taking place, the guys were just being thoughtful and intentional and trying to treat her like they did when they were dating. And, and that's been a real benchmark for me is that some of the sweetest things in life are not the biggest stuff, but it's the little stuff. Dale, there are two things come to mind, as you, and, and both are dated now, but there's an old movie called Fireproof, very similar to what you just described. A book that goes along with it is called Love Dare, and, and it's just, the, the, the whole idea is changing uh, your relationship by changing your behavior. Uh, act your way into feeling instead of feeling your way into acting. Well, why don't you do that? Because I don't feel like it. No, the feelings aren't there. Well, act lovingly, and the feelings have a way of coming back. I'd recommend both the movie uh, and the book. Last well, third minute, Shane says, our kids will learn more from guys from how we treat their mom than any other single relationship thing that, that they learn. And it's not just what we say, it's the tone and the manner in which we say that. But you just stop and think about it. The biggest single example that our kids are going to have on relationships is how we treat their mother. Can you come back to this next week? Because yeah. we've got less than five minutes. Yeah, and we've got th these last six ideas. You know, every week there, uh, there are six basic characteristics. There are usually six main points. And then kind of homework, the, the putting, it, uh, putting it to work. Um, write down 10 things you love or like about your spouse. I, I think you just described that. Right? Don't just write them down. Tell, tell your husband. Tell your wife. They said if you have trouble at 10, do 5. Somebody said if you're having trouble at 10, do 5. Did you all hear that? <laughs> you can't find 10, do 5. Uh, but I think also with our with our children, let's, let's make sure they know. And, and listen, this is not just things they do, but who they are. Um, one, one thing that I just think is phenomenal, I said this last week, I think Tani is a tremendous caregiver. Um, she is the person in her family that takes care of everybody else in her family. Um, she's shown tremendous care for her aging grandparents uh, in, in times when her mother was in need to our children. And I think she's an incredible advocate of our children in making sure that there's an issue that it's, a, that it's addressed and, and resolved and they get help whenever they need it. I love that about and that's, that's part of who she is, not just what she does. And so learn to say those things. If, if you have a hard time saying it, write it. Well, we're going to get to that. Write it down. Create a positive, pleasant environment in your home. Uh, try reframing the situation. Let me tell you, this, this makes me laugh. Charles Williams has never said to me in the office, by the way, you, you all know Charles is one of our elders, and he's, he is the most proper Christian gentleman you're ever going to meet, and he always looks nice. And he's never said to me, Tim, why are you wearing jeans and a t-shirt to work? He's never said that. But when I come in for a funeral and I've got on a tie and a suit, he says, you look good today. <laughs> <laughs> he has reframed the situation. <laughs> Instead of saying, I don't like it when, or I wish you would, when you, I think we say of our kids sometimes, catch them doing something right. And never, so often, let them, and never let them forget it. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, and that's reframing. I think we often find what we're looking for. If you're constantly looking for something wrong, you're probably going to find it. Start looking for those other things. Dig for diamonds. I like that. Encourage appreciation by receiving it gracefully. We hit on that. I want to. I want to end with this. Uh, write birthday letters expressing your write. Write. Doesn't have to be a birthday. Put your love written for when um, many of you know Bill Smith when I came here Bill Smith said you need to write because if you write a book he talked about he though dead yet speaks right Cain and Abel when, it, when Abel dies his, his, his example outlives him he continues to speak even though he's dead can you imagine having a letter Charles Charles Williams has a letter from his best friend Jim Shear that, that, he's, that he's had from back when they were in the military serving and he and he came home and Jim said y'all remember this letter uh, he's like Jim Jim is writing Charles and he says you are at my mother's house sleeping in my bed 
eating my mother's cooking and dating my sister. Uh, and, and he's he in had, Guam. All, yeah, he's in Guam. He's, he's you know, serving overseas. And what a great friendship that's stood the test of a lifetime. And he still has this, this letter, uh, one that, one that um, Dan Walker read after, mm -hmm. uh, after Jerry passed away. And he got up that Thanksgiving and talked about what a blessing how thankful he was for their life together. And he had this letter that she wrote early on in their marriage. Write it down. And I want to say that not just to your spouse. Um, write letters to your children. Make sure that you leave something with them that will outlive you. Now, the, the, only, time, the only time I've ever seen this happen here, one man spoke at his own funeral. You remember, you remember Dave, Dave Harvey. I'll never forget it. He was in one. Of the, he was one of these swivel chairs, and the camera came on, and he rolled around like this. I looked at the camera. It was his funeral. And he goes like this. I expected more. <laughs> and then he started to speak to his wife and his children, and he said some of the most wonderful things. Uh, not just about what he loved about them, but lessons that he wanted them to remember uh, now that he was gone. Somehow, write it down, uh, leave, leave some form of communication so that after you, you know, that is so touching and, it, and it's a little uh, heartbreaking, but some, someday I'm, I'm going to, what is it, one, one of the, you had that thing for funerals, one of the other must stay, uh, one of the other must go, this is forever the way. At some point, you're going to say goodbye to someone you love for the last time. And so make sure that everything that should be said has been said. Um, and there is no regret. Dale? Lord Lord, next week we're going to talk about traditions. And just a couple of contexts and we'll be completely ready. When, when we moved to Australia, we were originally going to go with the team, but we were asked to go ahead. And so we're 26 years old, and our son is nine months old. And our first three years, we moved halfway around the world uh, by ourselves with no teammates. And if I kind of say us against the world, I mean, we're still not sure. That was either the bravest or the dumbest thing we've done. And we kind of alternate at different times in that. But because of that, and again, we're in, a, we're in a, another country and on and on it goes, then our family traditions became our lifeline for survival. I mean, it wasn't just, oh, this is a nice thing to do. This is if we're going to make it or if we're not going to make it. And so we will talk about a wide variety of things next week. There'll be some that you'll think, so that's, that's not us. But I'd like you also to be thinking as well in your family what are things that you do in your family that your kids or your family down the track will look at and maybe even when they become adults think, this is something I want to do in, in my family? Because those family traditions, the things we do together is really, really important. And the bottom line to me is not just the things we do together here, but talking about we're doing this stuff because we want to be doing this together eternally in heaven. These are the things that we're doing on earth and this is what our family does. So we'll be just talking about some possibilities of family traditions. And like I said, some of it, some will we'll just be thinking in your family, what are the family traditions that your kids are gonna remember and think about when they look back about what it was like to grow up in your house.